Hey guys! So the other day I was just looking at my phone and on my feed there was a suggested video and the video said ancient violin restoration. And, uh, and I thought, oh, that'll be interesting. So the violin on the picture really did look old. Um, and so I watched it. And uh, I think I need to do a reaction video. So the violin on the picture looks very, very old and very decrepit. But when it comes to, um, so, so let's just run the video. So here we go. It's brought in for restoration. It's in a horrid state and will require lots of specialist work to get it working and back to its original condition. So as I set up my studio. Oh wow, hang on, hang on a second. So the first thing they show is the tools he's gonna use. And, <laughs> and so he's got, have a look at this. So there's a, a couple of wrenches, a screwdriver, um, <laughs> a, a stonemason's chisel, a wire brush, and some other brushes that you'd use for house painting. Now, I, I can say, as a violin maker, none of those tools would be used to repair a violin, just so you know. I'm doing a violin restoration, and I've just got to get my tools ready. Okay, I think that should cover it. Okay, so he's he's got it up. It's an old Stradivarius copy. Now it's a, it looks like a, an old sort of Falkland violin, which uh, is a region in what was Eastern Germany, uh, possibly Bohemia. Uh, so the violin would have been made in the mid to late 1800s, maybe 1870s, 1880s, and at that time was already popular to actually own antique instruments. So they were made to look old. Very similar to, you know, I have some, uh, I, I have some beautiful instruments like the my Hofmeister violin, which is a, it's there to celebrate old German instruments. And uh, and so I, we make that to look old, to, to give the people of, Give people a feeling of playing a beautifully old instrument. So anyway, uh, let's let's keep going. So so people even 120, 140 years ago, people already wanted to own old instruments. The antique, like the idea of owning a Stradivarius, was already very romantic at the time. All right, let's have a look how he's going to do the restoration. So that's just the instrument. Obviously, the fingerboard is off. Uh, it's quite dirty. Uh, let me see, so yep, quite, quite dirty, looks like the, looks like the body is actually quite okay, like quite intact, but now I'm looking at the background here, in this picture I'm looking at the background, and the workshop is clearly not a violin workshop, I'll, but this, I'll show you, this is my violin workshop. So there's no, in my workshop, you can see a lot of hand tools. So that's clearly not the case here. So, uh, you know, you've got like, I can see welding tools, I can see hammers, I can see all sorts of things, but uh, very few actually sort of woodworking, hand woodworking tools. Okay. okay, all right, let's keep watching. Using turpentine, we begin to remove some of the 150 year old excess layers of dirt. Oh crap. Like he's literally, he's heading for the turpentine. The first thing he does is he heads for the turpentine and starts cleaning the instrument down with turpentine. Now, that instrument, like the body is fully intact, as you can see. So as he's cleaning it down with turpentine, oh, he's got, oh, he's got a new tool. He got the Lee Nielsen chisel. Brand new, out of the box, because he never <laughs> used one before. Now, here we go. Using a scraper. It's not a scraper, it's a type of chisel that he's using there. However, the way he's manipulating that, it's ridiculous. Like that, like the, the neck, you, you don't, like you use a, um, oh my God, no, no, don't take the scraper. Oh. 
<laughs> now when you, oh my god, no. Oh, that's terrible. That's that's not how you do it, that, that ruins the neck, because a scraper, oh, he's heading over it with a little sanding block. And now the fingerboard. I'm worried, a bit worried about the fingerboard. Yeah, no, the way he fitted that fingerboard is not the way to fit a fingerboard. I always use, oh, what's he using now? What's the blue? Finally, using an alcohol mix, we remove the old remove glue the old on both glue. the neck and fingerboard. But it's hide glue, so you just soak it with water and... It is important to measure the fingerboard size. Yeah, he, it's good that he's measuring the fingerboard size, that's good. But the mancha on this one is quite wrong. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, the fingerboard doesn't fit at all. Look, it's too small for the neck. No, 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 don't go for the tight bond. No, no, no. Okay, tight bond is a natural glue, but come on, use the proper height glue. Like, what, what about the next guy that has to open it? That is shocking, and that fingerboard is clearly didn't belong to that instrument, so he is going to have to... He's, ooh, <laughs> it just doesn't fit, even the sides don't fit. So he's, ooh, <laughs> and it's really thin. Interesting clamps, they're probably not a bad idea, but he's, looks to me... Yeah, he's going to have to adjust the sides. Here we go. Another clamp. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's that's terrible. And the way he's just sanding is really scary. He's uh, So he's sanding off the sides of the fingerboard here. And, like, how, how he's planing the fingerboard. Like, you, you don't scrape a fingerboard without planing it first. Uh, come into my workshop for a sec. So I, when I fit a fingerboard, like I always fit it with a plane, uh, and and I, I plane it because it, it it allows the me to have a totally flat surface. But also, so I'll show you. Um, hang on a second. Fingerboard. Firstly, I uh, so I plane it from end to end very carefully. To get a really totally level surface so I'll keep planing this until it's totally level and then I do the same thing with the fingerboard itself if I was to plane an old fingerboard I would plane it basically like like this again to get a totally flat surface <clears throat> And then I would fit the two surfaces to each other to make sure the fingerboard fits 100%. And next, when it comes to planing the fingerboard, you've seen me, um, you've seen me plane fingerboards. It's a very involved process. Uh, so, so he did, you know, I could see that he tried to make the fingerboard a bit hollow, but he didn't really use the right tools because, again, you would use a plane and then the scraper. Uh, also, you know, you, you'd want to make sure you have a template over the top to make sure everything's right. So, yeah, a lot of issues there. The nut and fingerboard work in unison. Using the sander, we gently crack the shape. Using the, um, the sander. Whoa, interesting way of uh, clamping the whole violin in. What glue is he using? That's crazy glue. That's, um, oh, I don't usually use that glue to for the nut either. That's not good. Okay. Here we go. The nut looks fairly, he's, you know, he's sort of adjusting it with a file and things like that. So that's probably similar to what I would do. That, that nut in the end, it looks okay. But you can see it's not, uh, but he's, he's really sanded off a fair bit of the timber on the instrument itself as well. Fantastic. It looks like he's done some rep, uh, guitar repair before. <laughs> Look at all these old pegs and things. Here we go. He's going to fit pegs now. I wonder how he's going to fit the pegs. Oh, those, those holes are reamed out very big. But anyway... And yeah, peg shaver, that's what I use. But those pegs are quite large. 
I try and make the pegs as small as possible because uh, it makes them easier to turn. You get more leverage. That's fairly, you know, that's kind of the way I do it. So nothing too wrong with the way they fitted the pegs. He fitted the pegs. I think my son can do better though. Hang on. But you're supposed to like sand. Hang on a second. He hasn't sanded the pegs to make them nice and smooth. So they're looking really rough because he's just used the peg shaver. Yeah, that's not so good. He did the ends nicely. They, they really do look nicely, but the pegs themselves look pretty rough. The bridge is possibly the most important part of a violin. A high quality bridge will enhance the sound, whereas a low quality bridge will destroy it. We start by trimming and then sanding the feet to fit the shape of the violin. Correct, we begin to shape the top. To the body of the violin, but filing the, the legs of the feet, that just shows not that much um, skill. Also, the, the chisel he's using is kind of blunt. And the finished bridge, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not like a high quality bridge. There's a lot of problems. Firstly, it's all really roughly carved. I mean, the carving is quite, kind of the signature, but it's, it's roughly done. And uh, it's also, it kind of curves upwards and the feet are quite thin, so it, it'll probably function, but it's not a, not a masterfully made bridge at all. A restoration such as this often throws unexpected challenges your way. In this case, we realized the body had fractured around the edges. Oh yeah, there's some open joints. That's, that's quite normal, open joints. I hope he uses hot glue for the open joints. Let's see. No, using tight bond. <sighs> I'm, I'm not a fan. Um, I, I think it is a type of tight bond, is a type of hide glue. But it's, uh, you know, you want to be able to remove it again. And and I, I just I just think if you just use hide glue, it's been proven. It's been used for over 500 years on violins. Why use a different type of glue that's not the same? And, uh, and, and again, like, you know, yes, there are modern glues. I understand that. But the modern glues haven't been tested for 500 years. So why not stick with something that works and, and, and we know we can remove, you know? And, you know, if super glue is great and if it can come out, come off and stuff like that, come to me. And, you know, it was invented in the 60s and 70s for the Vietnam War to glue wounds together, cyanoacrylate, now they use it on instruments, you know, prove to me that those joints will still be holding in, you know, 2120 in 100 years. Using turpentine, we begin to give the body of the violin a thorough clean, removing as much of the 150 years worth of dirt and grime as possible. So I'm not a huge fan of using, I, I worry about using um, turpentine to remove dirt. Um, because some varnishes will actually dissolve with turpentine. So in this case the varnish didn't, but I know some varnishes will, like, like some really expensive, beautiful antique instruments. We can begin to repolish and buff the body. For this, we use a standard wood polish. These polishes, that's not properly French polishing a, a violin at all. That's just a, um, a, the Hills polish, which is a combination of linseed oil, water and turpentine to, to kind of give that shine. But it doesn't, it's actually not a proper French polish. It doesn't add like, especially there's some areas there that are fully missing varnish. Um, you know, you don't want to those areas do need to get some varnish on them to protect them. But to beautifully antique the instrument, isn't it? And, and it's looking good. What he's doing is actually, it's looking quite nice. I'm really going to question the playability of the instrument because 
I can see he, you know, he's obviously not a trained violin maker. We also polished the pegs, giving them a uniform dark finish. Oh yeah, he's polishing the pegs now, that's good. I, I would have sanded them as well. We now begin the rebuilding and restringing process. We start with a scraper to resize the hole to fit our new end pin. So he's doing the end pin, he's calling it a scraper. It's called a rima, this tool. This is a rima, this is a scraper. Very different tools. No stringing up the interior. It looks to me like he's actually strung up uh, violins before, uh, but probably more, um, probably more guitars. He's using tonica strings. It's an unusual, like I, I don't like marking, like I, I like using um, dividers to, but why would you put the string grooves on the bridge before you put on the strings? That's weird. Sound post plays a hidden but vital role. In it's nice that he's tuning with a tuning fork, so that's good. That sound post doesn't quite fit down the bottom that he showed there. But you know, he's done those things. They're, they're okay. I'm probably... It's just, you know, he's using rudimentary tools to do stuff, which is... Uh, you know, and you can see he's got a bunch of guitars, electric guitars and things. He hasn't strung the strings on properly, but that's fine. Yeah, but I mean, the finished product, it, it looks okay. It just, to me, feels like he's not a professionally trained violin maker. Um, so he's going to play it now. Let's have a look. Oh, got the shoulder rest, con shoulder rest. The string spacing looks really wide to me, looks a bit too wide. He obviously sells violins, so maybe he does do some violin repair. But yeah, the string spacing looks really wide to me as well. Yeah, bit okay. I, I would have taken it a lot further, but um, you've seen some of my violin restorations. So there you have it. Like, I mean, it's uh, to, to me, the instrument looked okay at the end. Uh, the, uh, like I said, the fingerboard didn't look masterfully um, fitted to me. Uh, it didn't look like it was planed 100% correctly. Um, just lengthwise. Um, to me, it looked the bridge was definitely amateurish. It looked like the string spacing was a bit far apart. So, I mean, you know, the guy did okay. Uh, he's clearly not a violin maker, but he's, he's probably, you know, done repairs for, like he's probably done some violin repairs, probably done some guitar repairs and things like that as well. Um, but uh, you can see this good, the kind of tool skills that when he was carving the bridge and things like that, it, it looked the part, but when you saw the bridge at the end, you could see it wasn't that masterfully carved. When you have a bridge, you can, you know, like just, just in here, um, you know, the, this is an older bridge, but uh, if um, just the carving out, say on the, on the legs here, the carving out of the kidneys, uh, the heart and things like that, it all just didn't quite look the part and, and the, just the finishing. So, so, you know, these are little touches that to me are very important. But anyway, you know, but I, I to call it an ancient violin restoration, uh, this here is an old violin. It's, a, it's an old, old German Fretschner violin from the 18, uh, oh, sorry, from the 1780s. It actually still has the original label. I think it's... It's it's like in the in the late seventeen seventies or something like that, you know that that's a real violin restoration. The other one is basically what he did on that instrument was probably you could call it a restoration, but it could, could also be called just a uh, you know service that hadn't been done for many years. 
Uh, anyway, I hope, uh, hope you like my response to that video. If you like the video, hit the like button, subscribe, hit the little bell. That way you find out every time I post a new video and keep making beautiful music. All right, see you guys. Bye. Thank you.